Um, once again, I'd like to introduce Dr. Benjamin Newcomer, who is a food animal clinician at the Large Animal Teaching Hospital at Auburn University, and he's going to continue on and talk about neurological case studies. So let's welcome Dr. Newcomer. Thank you, Dr. Houston. So just follow up on the talk earlier with a couple cases uh, that we've seen in the recent future. You'll see some similarities, but also some differences between these two cases. And at the end, you can tell me what we did wrong and what we should have done differently. So this first case, um, 40 homegrown Angus steers. This was in North Alabama. Uh, they'd just been weaned three weeks previously. Pretty good calves, average about 700 pounds body weight. Uh, actually owned by a veterinarian, he had, he had some cattle. Um, and they called us because over the past few days, they had had seven in that group of 40 that were clinically affected. Two had died, two were affected. They treated them with LA-200 and banamine and they thought they got better. And then uh, those two had died. They'd also treated them but did not get better. And then they brought three to us because uh, they were worried this was something that was spreading through the herd. You'll find out. You got to wait and see, Dr. Houston. Okay. Um, so his complaint for these three that he brought us, he thought maybe they were ataxic, but he really wasn't sure. He said maybe they're blind. Is it laminitis? He really wasn't sure. He hadn't gotten them up and looked at them closely, but that's what he thought he saw in the field. There's a little bit of stumbling, a little bit of ataxia. When he did try to get them up and load them on the trailer, they would go down. Eventually, they'd get back up, and he did get them on the trailer. Um, but at least in the case of those other four, um, they'd eventually go down. Um, two of them did get better, but two of them stayed down, and then a couple days later, they were dead. And so he did make the point that no respiratory disease, lungs sounded clear, didn't see any coughing, nasal discharge, anything like that that you might expect in that three-week period following weaning. Um, so he didn't think it was, it was respiratory disease. So these steers, and this isn't them, this is a stolen picture, but they were um, in a dry lot corral, and they were feeding a commercial growing ration that was pretty hot, and so one of the things that he was worried about was uh, potentially burning up their rumen. He was also feeding some homegrown haylage uh, that they had made uh, on the farm as they had done for, for years before. And processing at weaning three weeks earlier was pretty standard for their protocol. Vaccination, clostridial, dewormed, uh, and lot. So, here you go, Dr. Houston. When they presented here to Auburn, one was dead already on the trailer. Uh, one was recumbent, and so we went ahead and euthanized that one after a physical exam. Uh, I'm pretty good at euthanizing things. Um, but one was ambulatory, uh, so we did um, do a good physical exam and then stuck him in the barn to watch him for a couple days. Both of these that were alive when they came in, pretty normal mentation. So they were alert, responded to stimuli, um, really no cranial nerve deficits, so everything intracranial seemed to be par for the course, seemed to be going well. And physical exam was largely unremarkable uh, for this ambulatory calf, other than it, it was definitely weak. So even just walking it from one barn to the next, uh, it was noticeably weak. It would almost collapse, or it did collapse once or twice, but then it would get up and, and make it to the stall. So at this point, uh, we didn't really know what was going on, but here, here was our differential list. Botulism, uh, certainly not common. Organophosphate, certainly not common, but can cause some weakness. Uh, TME, maybe, uh, particularly if you think about the two he said were, were getting better after antibiotics. Not sure why, but certainly that doesn't fit with your top two. Listeria, just with the fact that he's feeding haylage and we're seeing some neurologic signs, but that's pretty low on the list. Hypocalcemia can certainly cause weakness too, but there's no reason that I can think of why these calves should have been hypocalcemic at this point. So we were scratching our heads for a little bit on those. And I'll let you scratch your heads for a little bit, and we'll switch gears and talk about a second case. This one's more recent, and I'll come back to case one, don't worry. Um, but this was one we saw just, just last fall. This was another group of homegrown calves just south of us. Uh, also raised by a veterinarian, actually. Uh, much bigger group, 300 calves, uh, raised on the farm. He had them split into two different pastures after weaning, uh, one for the males, one for the females. 
Uh, some of the males were castrated, others were not. So we had some steers and bulls in there together. Um, and so what they had noticed, uh, just really over the two days prior, the, prior to when they brought them to us, is that three of them were recumbent. They had one die suddenly, but then there were several others that, again, seemed to be ataxic, blind, kind of stumbling around, not coming up to feed like they should have been. And so when they continued to get more affected, they loaded three of them up and brought them to us. And I don't know what it is with threes, but apparently that's the magic number. So just like that other group, these were raised on the farm. He did this every year, raised the calves, conditioned them himself, and then sent them off to a feedlot. Uh, in his case, he was feeding a complete pelleted ration, so no outside forage. It was all included into this pellet. Uh, which he actually made himself, or he owned a feedlot where he was um, not only making his own feed, but also selling commercial feed. And so they were going through quite a bit of feed a week. He was getting a new load twice a week, every three or four days were coming in. Um, but this was a mill that he's owned for a long time and the same ration that he's used for a long time. So, um, and really just all those signs had developed within the previous 72 hours, like I said. So again, three, three came in here to the clinic. One of them was recumbent on the trailer. So we went ahead and uh, euthanized him, tried to get, sent him off for necropsy right away to get, get a diagnosis. And then we had one bull and one steer that were still in relatively decent shape that we, we worked up a little bit. So these, as opposed to that first group, uh, they were pretty severely depressed. So uh, very obviously not responding to mental stimuli. Uh, you could walk right up to them. Uh, and then when you touched them, they'd react, but they were, they were definitely blind. Okay. Um, they did have an intact PLR, although it was a little bit questionable. Um, so certainly blindness with an intact PLR would indicate central blindness as opposed to peripheral blindness. Um, and I put the question mark here just because we weren't totally sure if that PLR was, was good or not. Our barn wasn't completely dark, a little harder to evaluate. Okay. But we did have symmetrical clinical signs, no cranial nerve cephalids, so we're thinking something to do with the cerebrum again uh, as we form our differential diagnosis list. And so particularly in this group of calves, cerebral disease uh, on low forage diet, certainly PEM has to be up there on our list, and it was. Thiamine deficiency, sulfur, salt, lead, just like we talked about. Didn't really think lead would be getting to all of these calves, even though they were getting fed from the same source. We did have calves from both pastures being affected, uh, so it wasn't just one pasture or the other. Uh, TME could potentially be on there. We don't see a lot of TME in Alabama, uh, but couldn't rule it out. And then hypovitaminosis A uh, will cause a peripheral blindness. Um, and because there was that question of what those PLRs were, uh, we couldn't totally rule out hypovitaminosis A, particularly since all these calves weren't really getting any forage per se. Uh, and so that was on our list at that point. All right, jumping back to case one, uh, what we do, of course, we did do some blood work just because this seemed to be a bigger issue. Uh, we did pull some CSF, uh, but really non-diagnostic on, on either of those. And so <clears throat> we went ahead and started, started that uh, one calf on treatment. We went ahead and started him on LA200, even though we didn't really have an infectious etiology higher on the differential diagnosis list. But in the history, supposedly it had a couple calves that had responded to LA200. So we started that dexamethasone uh, just for the anti-inflammatory properties and then thiamine as well. Ran a bunch of other diagnostics as well, just trying to figure out what was going on. Certainly this guy was pretty concerned that he was burning through his calves pretty quick. Unfortunately, nothing really was jumping out at us. We did run some uh, virology for both BVD as well as herpes virus. That came back negative. Interestingly, serology for both BVD and herpes virus were negative. And that's interesting just because these calves were supposedly vaccinated at the time of weaning. So I would have expected that we should have seen at least some increase in titer, and we really didn't. So that led to another discussion about vaccination protocol, but 
Um, and then we, we ran a tox screen uh, on the feed. Uh, mycotoxin screen was, was negative. The feed analysis, uh, just your routine feed analysis like Dr. Stockler was talking about, uh, nothing really jumped out at us on those. For case two, um, much the same situation. Blood work initially was largely unremarkable. Uh, we did try to get CSF and were unsuccessful, even after I told you in the previous hour that it's pretty straightforward to get CSF, but occasionally you get some where it's, it's not successful. And so we started treatment, thiamine, hoping it was going to be thiamine responsive polio, uh, dexamethasone, and vitamin A, just on the off chance that it was hypovitaminosis A. So back to case one, really didn't respond. In, in fact, this calf initially was ambulatory, had him walking around a stall, um, but that rapidly progressed over the course of 48 hours to he would go down and be unable to get up. If we got him up, he could ambulate. And then it got to the point where he just wouldn't be able to stand at all, even with help. Um, and so uh, when that continued, he uh, we decided to euthanize for another necropsy. Certainly no gross lesions on any of those calves at necropsy. No significant histopath lesions. Um, but when we really started digging into this, um, they were able to demonstrate botulinum toxin um, in this calf. And then we actually were able to demonstrate it in the halage as well. So. Uh, not sure if something got incorporated into that halage, apparently. Um, and so at least we, we got him a diagnosis, even though we weren't able to save it for the calves or save the calves. Okay. Case two is a little better story. Okay. So we really didn't see the rapid improvement that we would have hoped if it would have been thiamine responsive polio. Um, so they got a little better, a little more responsive, but certainly they were still blind even after three to four days of treatment. That one we sent to necropsy, really didn't see anything. Um, and like I said, that our, our feed screen was pretty negative. Um, but then we decided to look into the feed a little more, do the mineral analysis, just like Dr. Stockler talked about. In this case, we, we, we did get lucky because that sulfur level was incredibly high. So here you see the normal range for sulfur, 2100 to 3600, and we're, we're almost double that. And so, um, we pretty much had our diagnosis for sulfur toxicity, polio related to sulfur toxicity. Um, a lot of times sulfur toxicity becomes almost a you back into this diagnosis. So a calf presents with polio-like signs, you rule out response to thiamine. Uh, sometimes we assume it's sulfur. Uh, in this case, we were actually able to demonstrate it, which uh, was good, good for him. Talked to this guy a little bit later. Um, they had first changed out the feed. Um, and the calves were still doing good. He had a few that still remained blind, but they were to the point where they could get around pretty well and he would be able to ship them uh, along with the rest. And so um, he were at least happy about that. So any questions, comments, things I should have done differently on those calves? Yes, sir. Did any of the calves have tongue paralysis? Great question. So, and that's one of the things you always read about with botulism, right? And so we did, and that calf that remained alive, I would say the last 12 hours maybe before we euthanized it, it did. But up until then, so we had kept it alive for two to three days. Yeah, we pulled the tongue, great tongue tone. Um, and I don't know how consistent that is, but that tongue paralysis really didn't set in until the very end. Uh, for that calf. So we did see it. It was just very late in the progression of the disease. Yeah, good question. All right. Any more oh, questions? Sorry. So unrelated to these cases, kind of ongoing previous talks, if you thought a cow, she just she presented like maybe magnesium deficiency, but she's almost to term with a calf, starting to have a couple of them. Uh, so we went ahead to see indicator, mm -hmm. no improvement. Mm -hmm. So we continued to see MPK, we also get Bambi, she's swirling around, moving around a lot, like oh. you wouldn't suspect. So we're now transitioning to obviously something going on spinal, I don't know, baby pushing. Mm -hmm. um, but in any sense, which this cap, unfortunately, I just 
left this cow the other day, so I'm not sure where, <laughs> where we're standing. Um, but they did go ahead and get the hook fence. Now, I've heard mixed reviews on doing hook fence and tractoring them up. Some oh. doctors I'm hearing are saying yes because of nerve paralysis from laying. Others are saying it causes more problems. So okay. What is your standpoint when they've been down? This has been three days ago. So the question, as I understand it, is what's my opinion on hook lifts to get a cow up that's been down for a prolonged period? All right. And when you say hook pins, are you talking about the, the clamps? Okay. Yeah. Um, good question. And, it, and as you know, as you all know, a down cow is a bad deal, right? And the longer she stays down, the worse it is. So I think hip clamps can be a very good thing. I think they can also be a very bad thing. So certainly we know we can cause injury with hip clamps. However, in my mind, it's more important that we get that cow up. I think you can use hip clamps well, as long as you educate the client how to do it appropriately. Um, because in my mind, if we leave that cow standing on the ground, all that weight on those muscles, it's, a, it's, it's gonna be very poor prognosis. So I think we have to get her up you know, and hope for the best. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Dr. McConnell. Thank you.